What did Jesus do when he appeared to his disciples? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 20. All right. We saw, again, the death of Jesus and his burial. Now, the first day of the week, that's going to be Sunday. Of course, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early while it's still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away. Again, big, heavy stone, so this is hard to do. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. John never likes to mention himself by name, but we know who that is. Taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went running toward the tomb. The other disciple, John, beat Peter to the tomb. Now, you think of all the things that you remember, the one thing that John remembers the most is, I run faster. So he runs faster than Peter. And they go in, they look around, and they see the linen cloth lying there. Simon Peter came out. It's interesting. We're using his old and new name and went into the tomb. The cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the other linen cloths, but were folded up in a place by itself. What kind of tomb robbers fold up cloth? They don't, right? So this is something carefully done. It wasn't a scramble. It wasn't a thievery. It says, understand the scripture that he has to rise from the dead. I mean, it's funny how many times that Jesus said this, said the sign of Jonah, said these things. We talked about this before, and they didn't get it. Because we don't, I think, look to supernatural things in general. You know, if we see something happen, we think, like the Bermuda Triangle, oh, the boat, the boat just sank. You know, it, it was a bad storm. Boat sank. Boat sank all the time. So, you know, they go to the most logical conclusion. Someone took the body. We don't know where. And they weren't dragging back in their mind. Jesus has to rise. So they went back to their homes, it says. But then Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. And it says that uh, she's weeping outside of the tomb. She stoops and looks into the tomb, and she sees two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, and one at the head and one at the feet. Like I said, there's sort of like a little ledge that was in there that I saw. There was maybe not a little ledge, but a little border in there. And so one angel was sitting on one, and one was sitting on the other. And she's desperate to find out what happened. Why, where did they take my Lord? Where did they take Jesus? They asked the question woman, why are you weeping? And I like these angels because they, they were good at asking questions. I saw one of the commentaries even suggest that this could be the very same Moses and Elijah we saw before in the Gospels or just two angels. We don't know. Good questions. It's everyone keeping a list of all the good questions to ask someday when you get to heaven. This is a good one. She thought that this was the gardener. The one burial site is called the Garden Place. It was known to be lush and green. If you took him, take me to where you put him and I will carry him back. Now, obviously, Mary, chances are, could not carry Jesus back to the burial site. But it just points out that she just wasn't expecting it. It wasn't that the women understood what Jesus meant all along, but the men didn't. She didn't get it either, but she was being diligent. Then Jesus says to her, Mary, and she turns to him and says, Rabbanon, again, With the I at the end, it means my rabbi. This is personal. It's not just teacher. It's my teacher. And he says, don't cling to me for I have not ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. What's interesting is this passage caused a lot of confusion among people. When I was reading the various commentaries about this, it caused I think this idea that Jesus was in some sort of in-between state, don't touch him because he's in a in-between death and life kind of state. And I think it's not that mystical. This was something more historic. And what I think he's saying is, is that a couple of things could be possible. I'm not going to be with you much longer. I know you want to cling on to me and you want me to cling on to this body and not let me go. But you know what? I am going back to my father. So don't get too attached to holding on to me. 
And part of it, too, was maybe don't get too attached to this vision of me. I'm going back to my father. I'm going to sit at the right hand of God the Father. This phase is over with of having this physical body. It is time for you to move on and start thinking about the future of this church, not the past, which is me in the body where you could grab onto me, right? So I think it was more that than mystics or, you know, there was always that very first heresy, which was that Jesus didn't return into the body, that Jesus was always some sort of a spiritual soul, but never a physical soul. And for him to say, hey, don't cling on to me, then it started this whole thing up again. But that's not really what they're getting for. So she, Mary goes back and she tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he said all these things to me. So she went and told him. And so then Jesus, on that same evening of that day, first day of the week, John's very careful about telling about the days of the week, knocks at the door. And because the disciples were scared of the temple structure coming for them, door was locked. And then suddenly Jesus was standing between them. You know, he locks not going to stop Jesus. So the first thing he says, I think, is interesting. Peace be with you. Some of the commentary said, well, you know, that's because it prophesies in Isaiah that he's going to be the Prince of Peace. But I think that uh, it's different than that, too. When they le- left, it said that the shepherd is struck and the sheep scatter. They took off. You don't hear of them standing at the foot of the cross. You see the women there, but not the men. You see Peter deny Jesus three times. And I think this message of peace is, if you saw Jesus after he told you all these things were going to happen, you betrayed him all in your own individual ways, him saying peace be with you is like, we are, we're good. We are good. Don't be afraid. Don't feel guilty. You know, any of those things. So he showed him his hands and his side, you know, saying, this is my body before he's going to get a spiritual body. But you can see what happened to me. That wasn't a mistake. It wasn't some sort of a vision. It wasn't kind of a delusion. These things really did happen to me. He says again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Let's not get all worked up about the past and what my hands and my side and my feet look like. Let's talk about the future. I am sending you. And it reckons back to where he sent them out to give his words and heal and drive out demons in his name. And now he's saying, I'm sending you because we're going to start a new thing. And he breathed on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And I think this is the passage that always confused me a little bit because we've seen places in the ancient church where the church got very political because I'm on this guy's side and you're against that side, so I'm not going to forgive you. It is in the end. Jesus' forgiveness, God's forgiveness because of his act that forgives us. The the message he is telling people is that their big mission, their number one mission is the forgiveness of sins. And with the Holy Spirit has given them the authority to forgive sins. Telling people they need to hear it. And that's why we're told that too when we confess our sins and our pastor and our priest tells us that we are indeed forgiven of our sins. But because there are people who refuse to repent, I guess, or are taking glory in their sins, they're not asking for it. They're not, they're not seeking forgiveness. And so in this case, the church key message is of one of forgiveness. But that doesn't mean that if you have a corrupt pastor, priest, who refuses to forgive you because you're on the wrong side of X, Y, and Z, In the end, it is still Jesus' work that forgives. That's the important part to know. So I don't think we have to worry about a corrupt person telling us we're not forgiven when we understand that we come before Jesus with our sins and he forgives us. And they are that 
message of forgiveness. They are that mission of forgiveness. But I think what's unfortunate is throughout history, people didn't have access to the scriptures. So they weren't people who exactly knew what it said. But there is warning later coming in the scriptures for people who have the power of this new church and use it falsely. That's the important thing is we understand our forgiveness comes from Jesus. And the church is a visual representation of that. But if this is done roughly or in a bad way, that is not the act of God right then and there. Like, like I said, I just sort of read that, you know, in times of history where people were just not forgiven from them. Thomas comes back. He wasn't with the rest of them. And they tell him, you know, the Lord was here. We saw the Lord. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. He says, unless I see the marks of the nails and place my fingers in the mark of the nails in his sight, I will never believe it. It's not so much that he wanted to see it. It's that he was ready to turn against it. He was ready not to believe any of it. That's why this doubting went to a more extreme place. It wasn't him just doubting. He's just saying, like, I could see Jesus standing right before me. And I'm not going to believe it. it. It's an obstinance in there, too. And so it says eight days later, disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them to side and the door was locked. And Jesus came with them again. Peace be with you. He said, all right, Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Look at my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And of course, Thomas then said, my Lord and my God, have you believed because you have seen me? Really? You wouldn't have believed me based on the words of your brother, based on what I told you I was going to do or what was going to happen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. This was a reprimand to Thomas, who, it, like I said, was not just logical, as we said in the past, not just practical, maybe. But in this case, he is like, I'm not believing. I absolutely want physical proof. That's it, period. And so now comes the, the summary of the purpose of this book that John says that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which isn't written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The whole purpose, the reason I'm writing this book is so that you can believe. And it's someone who saw all this. He's a witness to all of this. And that ends John 20. What I'm going to meditate on is that idea that Jesus just wants to come and have peace. There's so many times, I think, in history, too, where people have tried to make God angry, make God vengeful, make God prickly and unforgiving, because it probably suited whoever was saying that's need. But instead, what we see is even after the biggest betrayals, Jesus stood among his people and said, peace be with you. He wants us to have that peace. And he also wants us to know we're being sent in order to let other people get this peace as well. What I'm going to pray about is that I never get into that position of Thomas, where I'm so difficult about something. I'm so trifled about something that I would say, I'm not going to believe in this. You know, I, I mentioned before that when I first became a Christian, I believed in Jesus. I believed he died for my sins. But I, I don't know why. I somehow didn't think heaven was real. Like, it's okay, God, if, if there's no heaven. I understand. But thank you for everything that you did kind of thing. It was, I don't know why. That was just like the step too far for me. And I never got obstinate about it. And I let my mind, I don't know, be affected by it, my, my reading of the scripture, and came to believe later all the things that heaven is going to be about. I think it's okay to have difficulties. But what Thomas did wrong here was to say, I have to have these very specific kinds of evidence, or I'm not going to believe it. Forget it. I pray that I never get into that position. And what I'm going to share with others is exactly that, that the Holy Spirit was sent out to help us, that we were put on our mission to tell other people about God's forgiveness, how to gain God's forgiveness. And this is the mission we have been given from God himself. 
All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this and anything else you might have to say with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.